From the early 17th century up until the late 19th century, the foundation of what would become the Yakuza was laid. The Yakuza is, as many of you may already know, the name given to Japan's infamous crime groups. Besides their trademark tattoos and affinity for expensive suits, part of what makes them so infamous are their close connections to Japan's politics. Just how deep do these connections go? Well, what if I told you that Japan's shocking entry into World War II was hugely influenced by a man with close ties to the Yakuza? Toyama Mitsuru managed to gather a following which was so large that even for the Japanese parliament and royalty, he was impossible to ignore. This group of followers, helped by the ideas and ambitions of their leader, came frighteningly close to realizing its dream of taking over not just Asia, but maybe even the world. This is the story of Toyama Mitsuru and the Dark Ocean Society. Between the late 1800s and the early 1900s, Japan went through an unprecedented period of growth. For the first, but not the last time, the land of the rising sun performed an economic miracle. This period was known as the Meiji Restoration, named after the emperor of Japan at the time. During this time, Japan was finally able to use all of that knowledge and work ethic that they weren't really able to profit from until then. Political change was also afoot, with Japan adopting a parliament and political parties for the first time in their history. Japan's population grew to 45 million people, an impressive number at the time. Meanwhile, the country's military and economic power grew at a similar rate. For many people, life was good and a definite improvement over the feudal Japan of old. On the island of Kyushu, however, things weren't so fine and dandy. Kyushu, at the time a poor region known mainly for coal mining, represents one of the five major islands which make up Japan. The island was also home to a huge number of ex-samurai, who were not exactly pleased with their country adopting a western-style government. The samurai were, after all, the representatives of traditional Japanese values. In the 1880s, the reluctance to the adoption of western values in Japan led to the birth of ultranationalism. Ultranationalism is a form of nationalism that goes far beyond just regular old pride of the country you reside in. Rather, it is patriotism that has transformed into a feeling of supremacy over other races and nations. Fukuoka, the most populous city on the island of Kyushu, was a hotbed for these extreme types of nationalists. It is no surprise then that the most influential nationalist in Japanese history would also be born here. Toyama Mitsuru was born in 1855 into a family of ex-samurai. Not a lot of information exists about his early life, but he was said to have had a tough childhood, growing up in poverty and selling sweet potatoes on the streets of Fukuoka. He is also said to have been a tough teenager, who knew how to defend himself while growing up idolizing samurai and Japanese traditional values. His love for these values would eventually turn political when he reached his 20s, with the young Mitsuru participating in one of the last samurai uprisings that took place across the country, the Saga Rebellion. To get a good picture of what these uprisings look like, watch the 2003 movie The Last Samurai starring Tom Cruise. It's a classic. Spoiler alert, the government eventually put an end to the uprisings once and for all, and Toyama was put in jail for three years as punishment for his participation. Upon his release from prison, he seemingly didn't lose any of his passion for the old values, joining a nationalist group called Kiyoshisha, or the Pride and Patriotism Society. There, Toyama rose through the group's ranks quickly, hiring the toughest guys that Fukuoka had to offer. By not shying away from using force, his group was able to keep laborers in check, which there were many of in the region's countless coal mines. With time, Toyama became popular not only with citizens, but also politicians. While the poor people in the area called him the emperor of the slums for handing out money to them in large amounts, 
political figures respected him for his large following and violent tactics. Eventually, it was time for Toyama to found his own group, and so he did just that. Toyama was only 26 years old when he founded the Gen Yosha, or Dark Ocean Society, in 1881. There are many, many negative things to say about this man, but you gotta admit, that's a really, really cool name. But while it may sound cool, the meaning behind it is quite a dark one. The Dark Ocean represents the ocean which separates Japan from mainland Asia, namely China and South Korea. Toyama dreamed of his home country expanding its borders beyond its islands, conquering both its neighbors by any means necessary. His goal was to steer Japan in this exact direction. To do this, he needed the support of the people. A lot of people. His tactic was clear from the start. Ex-samurai and all other supporters of feudalism had strong feelings of hatred toward their democratic government, pulling these frustrated citizens into an ultra-nationalist group which fights for the traditional values that they missed so much was a simple task in most cases, and Toyama knew exactly how to use this vulnerability to his advantage. Officially, the code of the Dark Ocean Society was quite vague. Revere the Emperor, love your nation, defend the rights of the people. However, Toyama's intentions were of a violent nature, and of course, he expected the members of his group to follow suit. It didn't take long for the Dark Ocean Society to develop relations with politicians. Some members of the group worked as bodyguards for higher-ranking government officials. Others worked in the field of persuasion, helping political figures get what they want. Of course, intimidation and violence was their main method of quote-unquote persuading their victims. The Dark Ocean Society also had a legitimate workforce at their disposal though, including plumbers and carpenters. Not only did they infiltrate every aspect of everyday life, they also had their own ultra-nationalist schools. At these schools, foreign languages and martial arts were taught to the next generation of nationalists. But spy techniques were also on the Dark Ocean Society curriculum. Eventually, spies educated at these schools would form a Japanese intelligence network, which would be crucial to the country's endeavors. The society's influence in Japanese politics grew bigger and bigger. Intimidation of voters as well as politicians and laborers worked as a tool of steering the public towards their own political ideology. This was not only beneficial to their goals of pushing Japan to the far right, but it also made them a lot of money. This money was invested into the planning of even more high-profile assassinations and attacks, creating a vicious cycle. Among these attacks was the stabbing of liberal politician Itagaki Taisuke in 1881 as well as the bomb attack on future Prime Minister Okuma Shigenobu in 1889, which did cost him a leg, but not his life. All of this assassination practice culminated in the group's biggest plot yet, which involved the 1892 national elections. These elections would go down as the most violent of its kind in Japan's history. It is considered to be the first big collaboration between rightist groups and Yakuza, aiming to disrupt the voting process, especially in areas with support for the Liberal Party. Toyama worried that his already impressive numbers of manpower would not suffice, called upon the help of a gang boss from Kumamoto. 300 of his men came to support Toyama, while the Minister of Home Affairs mobilized the police force for backup. This army of rightists, gangsters and policemen burned down politicians' properties, while intimidating and attacking voters. 388 people were injured, while 25 lost their lives. For some people at the top, this was seemingly enough to convince them of Toyama's power. Their next mission came only three years later, in 1895. It was a secret request from none other than the Minister of War. A request which asked the Dark Ocean Society to start a quote-unquote fire in Korea. On the morning of October 8, 1895, Toyama's men, trained in the ninja arts, infiltrated the Korean royal palace and assassinated the Queen of Korea. This opened the door for a Japanese invasion, which led to Korea's annexation in 1910. Japan would not leave Korea until 1945. 
Back in Japan, ultra-nationalist groups started popping up seemingly everywhere, gaining notoriety among the country's citizens. For them, Yakuza and ultra-nationalists blended together into one entity, for good reason. By now, groups like the Dark Ocean Society had adapted the same hierarchy system as Yakuza gangs, and even performed the same initiation rituals as well. Meanwhile, Yakuza had a similarly negative attitude to anything foreign, and developed the same political opinions. For the Yakuza though, these political opinions were more financially motivated than ideologically, which was the case for more and more ultranationalists as well. Certain rules established by the new democratic government severely hurt Yakuza business and made their lives much, much harder. For example, gambling had to be kept even more underground than before, with gambling being one of the main money makers of the Japanese mafia. In search of support, the Yakuza entered a new age of collaboration with rightist groups. There was one group in particular which appealed to them, Kokuri Yokai, newly founded in 1901 by Uchida Ryohei, who was a right-hand man of Toyama. This group can be considered a successor to the Dark Ocean Society, not only in ideology, but also in name. Kokuryu refers to the Amur River, which represents the boundary between Manchuria, which is now a part of China, and Russia. This was a clear statement. For the ultranationalists, the invasion of Korea was not enough. Ultimate control of the whole Asian continent was the goal, while some fanatic supporters even longed for Hakuichi-u, or the eight corners of the world under one roof. A Japanese roof, that is. A name which has more commonly been associated with the Amur River Society is Black Dragon Society. It stems from an alternative spelling of the group's name, utilizing the letters for Black and Dragon. Again, an incredibly cool name for an incredibly evil organization. In order to continue the success of its predecessor group, the Black Dragon Society took over its members and policies, which would see them experience substantial growth over the next 30 years. Along the way, Toyama played an important advisory role in guiding the new group. With his help, they pushed Japan into a successful war with Russia and set up an invasion of China. Despite all the violence during these years, Japan continued to grow, establishing a healthy middle class by the 1920s. Toyama's power grew just as quickly. In seemingly no time, he was having dinner at the Imperial Palace while maintaining healthy relationships with powerful politicians, and even the imperial family. The next step up in power for Toyama came in the year 1919, when, with the help of the Minister of Home Affairs, he did something unprecedented. He formed the nation's first federation of gangsters, the Dai Nippon Kokusui Kai, or the Great Japan National Essence Society doesn't quite roll off the tongue like the last two groups' names. The federation boasted 60,000 members, among them gangsters, laborers, and of course, ultranationalists. The same principles of the Dark Ocean Society applied here as well, but in actuality, they were nothing more than the world's biggest group of strike breakers. The Kokosui Kai brought a new level of violence to the table, receiving support from police, and even some high-ranking military officials. One notable strike-breaking job carried out by the Federation was the attack on 28,000 men during the Yawata Iron Works strike in 1920. However, Toyama occasionally used the manpower at his disposal against personal enemies as well, making him one of the most dangerous and powerful men in the country. One thing that the Federation of Gangsters did not have to worry about was a lack of work. They were employed by the Seiyukai, one of two dominant political parties in Japan at the time. Having no choice but to do the same, the second dominant party, called Riken Menseito, also hired gangsters, most of them Yakuza. With that, the Japanese Mafia had officially entered Japanese politics, with ties reaching so deep that some Yakuza bosses even made it into parliament. By the 1930s, though, the violence became too much, even for the seemingly unshakable people of Japan, with the country's politics destabilizing as a result. 
From 1930 until 1945, a total of 29 violent incidents in politics were recorded. Among these incidents were the assassinations of two prime ministers and two finance ministers. For the Yakuza, the 1930s were the best time of their lives. The government put them in charge of running land development in Manchuria, which was occupied with the Black Dragon Society's help. In actuality, their job was fostering an addiction among Chinese citizens by running an opium business. This didn't only make money for Japan, but also weakened the resistance of said Chinese citizens against the Japanese invasion. The opium business was only one of many heinous acts committed by the Japanese government in Manchuria at the time. Some of these acts being way too violent in nature to describe here. Yakuza members who stayed in Japan were also swimming in money. Due to the country's expansion, the nation accumulated a fortune, which the gangsters knew how to utilize for their own gain. It was also around this time that the Yakuza gangs started controlling many of the busiest ports across Japan. One of these ports was located in Kobe, in the Kansai region of Japan, which would also be the birthplace of the biggest and most powerful Yakuza gang that ever existed, the Yamaguchi-gumi. For Toyama, times couldn't have been much better either. His wealth and power increased exponentially, symbolized by a historic moment in 1937, when he officially introduced the new Prime Minister of Japan, Prince Konoe Fumimaro, to the Japanese public. Considering how powerful Toyama was, he may as well have had a hand in the Prime Minister's appointment. Konoe was known to share similar feelings towards foreign powers as Toyama did, which would set off a chain of events that would change the course of history. Before becoming the Prime Minister, Konoe wrote about his travels to the US, France and England. In his book, he wrote about the growing overseas hostility towards the people of Japan. In addition, a US government policy which saw people of Asian descent barred from entering America was seen by Konoe as a humiliation of the Japanese people. Might these two factors have possibly awoken feelings similar to those of ultranationalists? Upon Konoe's rise to power, he gave his good friend Koichi Kido a job in the government, making him the Minister of Education. A few years later, Koichi had become the main advisor of Emperor Hirohito. For Koichi, a man named Hideki Tojo was the only logical choice as the next Prime Minister. Hirohito listened to his advisor and gave Tojo the most powerful political position in Japan. He would go on to hold this position from 1941 until 1944. On December 7, 1941, Japan officially joined the stage of World War II with an attack on Pearl Harbor, ordered by Tojo. This attack did not only plunge both the US and Japan into World War II, it was also the beginning of the end of government relations with Yakuza and ultranationalist groups. With a war keeping them more than busy, the government saw no use for a continuing partnership between the two. Japan's laser focus on waging war on more than one front did not only take away a lot of influence and power from Yakuza gangs, it would also make them very, very poor. With no resources, the 300-year-old Japanese mafia fell apart and wouldn't recover for a full decade. Toyama Mitsuru died in 1944 at the age of 89. He was no politician, nor a soldier or military leader. And yet, the seed that he had planted would change the fate of his own country. The Dark Ocean Society, the Black Dragon Society, and all the other ultranationalist groups that followed their ideals were instrumental to steering Japan into a ruthless, warmongering mindset. Without Toyama and these groups, who knows if the necessary political pieces would have ever fallen into place. For Toyama himself, a lifetime of working towards his dream seemed to have paid off. Before his death in 1944, Japan was still competing in a war. Almost all of Asia had been conquered and the world would soon be united under a Japanese roof. Toyama Mitsuru never had a chance to see the drastic changes that would occur right after his death. At that time, Japan had already begun showing some cracks, but not even a year later, Russia invaded Manchuria, while the US dropped the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Japan's failure and capitulation was sealed. 
In the end, Toyama and his nationalist societies changed absolutely nothing, but instead laid the foundation for the pain and suffering of millions of people. Tune in next time when we explore post-war Japan and the resurrection of the Yakuza under American occupation. Sayonara. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe and also check out my previous video which covers the early history of the Yakuza. 